Good evening. Today I'll be reading from Bullfinch's Mythology on Venus, or Aphrodite. I don't know whether the copyright is still active on this work. In any case, I'll be doing it under the Fair Use Act for the purpose of research and education. Reading from the index first. Venus. In Roman mythology, the goddess of beauty and love. Originally of minor importance, she became, through identification with the Greek Aphrodite, one of the major characters in classical myths. She was the daughter of Jupiter and Dione. According to another view, influenced by association with the Greek term aphros, meaning foam, she had sprung from the foam of the sea at Cyprus. Jupiter gave her in wedlock to Vulcan. She was the mother by Vulcan of Eros and Enteros, by Mars of Harmonia, by Anchises of Aeneas, etc., she wore a magic girdle which enabled its wearer to arouse love in others. She plays an important part in many legends and stories. She gave beauty as a gift to Pandora, the first woman. She fell in love with Adonis and after his death changed his blood into the anemone. She first objected and finally consented to her son Cupid's, read Eros's, love for Psyche. She had Atlanta and Hippomenes changed into lions. She consoled Ariadne and gave her Bacchus as her husband. She competed against Juno and Minerva for the Apple of Discord and was given the prize by Paris. She destined Helen, the wife of Menelaus, for Paris, and caused thus the Trojan War. She sided with the Trojans against the Greeks, and enlisted the help of her admirer, Mars, etc., etc. So... This is all symbol-level stuff we've just read. And it doesn't easily reveal its practical importance. And before I go on reading about Venus, I'd like to connect some dots that may help to reveal the practical importance of Venus and make the rest of this a little more understandable. The first... And please bear with me here. We're going to go to the Bible. The Holy Bible. That is Revelation 22, 16. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. Surely I am coming soon. Nice, huh? Did you also know that Lucifer is associated with the planet Venus? Lucifer's name, as you may know, can be expressed as the adjective light-bringing. Lucifer is known as the morning star. So, we're tying together Venus, Jesus, and Lucifer. That's going to get wilder from here. And before the end of this, I'm going to explain, in layman's English, what the importance of Venus is in scientific terms. That's right. Rational and logical terms. What Venus's role is in this world. But let's go back to the mythology book here. Page 6. Venus, Aphrodite, the goddess of love and beauty, was the daughter of Jupiter and Dione. Others say that Venus sprang from the foam of the sea. 
The zephyr wafted her along the waves to the Isle of Cyprus, where she was received and attired by the seasons, and then led to the assembly of the gods. All were charmed with her beauty, and each one demanded her for his wife. Jupiter gave her to Vulcan in gratitude for the service he had rendered in forging thunderbolts. So the most beautiful of the goddesses became the wife of the most ill-favored of gods. Venus possessed an embroidered girdle called Cestus, which had the power of inspiring love. Her favorite birds were swans and doves, and the plants sacred to her were the rose and the myrtle. Cupid, read Eros, the god of love, was the son of Venus. He was her constant companion, and, armed with bow and arrows, he shot the darts of desire into the bosoms of both gods and men. There was a deity named Anteros, who was sometimes represented as the avenger of slighted love, and sometimes as the symbol of reciprocal affection. The following legend is told of him. Venus, complaining to Themis that her son Eros continued always a child, was told by her that it was because he was solitary, and that if he had a brother, he would grow apace. Anteros was soon afterwards born, and Eros immediately was seen to increase rapidly in size and strength. So, moving to page 80. Chapter 11. Cupid and Psyche. A certain king and queen had three daughters. The charms of the two elder were more than common, but the beauty of the youngest was so wonderful that the poverty of language is unable to express its due praise. The fame of her beauty was so great that strangers from neighboring countries came in crowds to enjoy the sight and looked on her with amazement. Paying her that homage which is due only to Venus herself. In fact, Venus found her altars deserted while men turned their devotion to this young virgin. As she passed along, the people sang her praises and strewed her way with chaplets and flowers. This perversion of nomage due only to the immortal powers, to the exaltation of a mortal, gave great offense to the real Venus. Shaking her ambrosial locks with indignation, she exclaimed, Am I then to be eclipsed in my honors by a mortal girl? In vain, then, did that royal shepherd whose judgment was approved by Jove himself, give me the palm of beauty over my illustrious rivals, Pallas and Juno. But she shall not so quietly usurp my honors. I will give her cause to repent of so unlawful a beauty. Thereupon she calls her winged son Cupid, mischievous enough in his own nature, and rouses and provokes him yet more by her complaints. She points out Psyche to him and says, My dear son, punish that contumacious beauty. Give thy mother a revenge as sweet as her injuries are great. Infuse into the bosom of that haughty girl a passion for some low, mean, unworthy being, so that she may reap a mortification as great as her present exaltation and triumph. So here we have Venus, Psyche, and Cupid, which is Venus's son. Venus is love and beauty. Cupid's Cupid. We'll get into him in a minute. But Psyche... 
psyche is your mind, or my mind, or the mind of the human. What they're alluding to here is the love that's generated in the minds of humans versus the love that is. The one binding force that holds this universe together. Love is a binding force. As I have found, as a man, it's pretty simple to destroy something. Take a sledgehammer and smash up a brick wall that it took somebody, you know, 30 or 40 hours to lay. But using the brick wall as an allegory, most people don't understand what kind of expertise it takes to build a brick wall. It takes skill and it takes expertise. It is definitely a lot harder than knocking it down with a sledgehammer, which any idiot with shoulder muscles can do. In that brick wall, the love component is the mortar, which cradles the brick. In science itself, At the building block level of the universe, beyond the subatomic, science recognizes that what holds, say, an atom together, that force which holds the atom together, or the force by which everything is held together, is called dark matter, or dark forces. And they say that most of the universe is composed of dark matter. That only a very small percentage of it is composed of, I guess, light matter. Darkness is representative of the feminine. And so here we see it going in one complete circle back to Venus. The primordial force of love that puts order into the universe, or allows it to have order, rather, by allowing it to stay together, that love is not owned by men or by any other creature. It's in everything that has substance, it has existence. So what Venus is getting so angry about here is that loves are formed in the psyche and they're not real loves. They're, I guess you could call them fantasies. That's not really right either because fantasies can give rise to acts of great love and real love at that. It just depends on how someone handles the fantasy, as any artist knows. So, Venus orders her son, Cupid, to punish Psyche. Reading from the book, Cupid prepared to obey the commands of his mother. There are two fountains in Venus's garden, one of sweet waters, the other of bitter. Cupid filled two amber vases, one from each fountain, and, suspending them from the top of his quiver, hastened to the chamber of Psyche, whom he found asleep. He shed a few drops from the bitter fountain over her lips, though the sight of her almost moved him to pity, then touched her side with the point of his arrow. At the touch she awoke, and opened eyes upon Cupid, himself invisible, which so startled him that in his confusion he wounded himself with his own arrow. Heedless of his wound, his whole thought now was to repair the mischief he had done, and he poured the balmy drops of joy over all her silken ringlets. Psyche, henceforth frowned upon by Venus, 
and derived no benefit from all her charms. True, all eyes were cast eagerly upon her, and every mouth spoke her praises, but neither king, royal youth, nor plebeian presented himself to demand her in marriage. Her two elder sisters, of moderate charms, had now long been married to two royal princes, but Psyche, in her lonely apartment, deplored her solitude, sick of that beauty which, while it procured abundance of flattery, had failed to awaken love. So Cupid is going to poison Psyche with bitter waters. Eh, I don't know if poison's the right word, but what's going to happen when bitter waters are given to Psyche? So he puts the bitter waters on her lips. And then, this isn't explained really. He touched her with the point of his arrow while she's sleeping. Why did he do that? It caused her to wake up, and then she saw him. Continuing on with the book. Her parents, afraid that they had unwittingly incurred the anger of the gods, consulted the oracle of Apollo and received this answer. Quote, the virgin is destined for the bride of no mortal lover. Her future husband awaits her on the top of the mountain. He is a monster whom neither gods nor men can resist. The dreadful decree of the oracle filled all the people with dismay, and her parents abandoned themselves to grief. But Psyche said, Why, my dear parents, do you now lament me? You should rather have grieved when the people showered upon me undeserved honors, and with one voice called me a Venus. I now perceive that I am a victim to that name. I submit. Lead me to that rock to which my unhappy fate has destined me. Accordingly, all things being prepared, the royal maid took her place in the procession, which more resembled a funeral than a nuptial pomp. And with her parents, amid the lamentations of the people, ascended the mountain on the summit, of which they left her alone, and with sorrowful hearts returned home. While Psyche stood on the ridge of that mountain, panting with fear and with eyes full of tears, the gentle Zephyr raised her from the earth and bore her with an easy motion into a flowery dale. By degrees her mind became composed, and she laid herself down on the grassy bank to sleep. When she awoke, refreshed with sleep, she looked round and beheld nearby a pleasant grove of tall and stately trees. She entered it, and in the midst discovered a fountain, sending forth clear and crystal waters, and fast by a magnificent palace whose august front impressed the spectator that it was not the work of mortal hands, but the happy retreat of some god. Drawn by admiration and wonder, she approached the building and ventured to enter. Every object she met filled her with pleasure and amazement. Golden pillars supported the vaulted roof, and the walls were enriched with carvings and paintings representing beasts of the chase and rural scenes, adapted to delight the eyes of the beholder. Proceeding onward, she perceived that besides the apartments of state, there were others filled with all manner of treasures and beautiful and precious productions of nature and art. While her eyes were thus occupied, a voice addressed her, though she saw no one uttering these words. Sovereign lady, all that you see is yours. We whose voices you hear are your servants, 
and shall obey all your commands with our utmost care and diligence. Retire, therefore, to your chamber and repose on your bed of down, and when you see fit, repair to the bath. Supper awaits you in the adjoining alcove when it pleases you to take your seat there. Psyche gave ear to the admonitions of her vocal attendants, and after repose and the refreshment of the bath, seated herself in the alcove, where a table immediately presented itself, without any visible aid from waiters or servants, and covered with the greatest delicacies of food and the most nectarious wines. Her ears, too, were feasted with music from invisible performers, of whom one sang, another played on the lute, and all closed in the wonderful harmony of a full chorus. So, Psyche gets banished to a mountain, supposed to meet a monster, and she's standing on the ridge of the mountain, and Zephyr comes, and takes her away to this fantastically wonderful realm. And now she is being treated to a banquet and music. So it's an interesting turn of fate for Psyche here. Let's see what happens to her. She had not yet seen her destined husband. He came only in the hours of darkness and fled before the dawn of morning, but his accents were full of love, and inspired a like passion in her. She often begged him to stay and let her behold him, but he would not consent. On the contrary, he charged her to make no attempt to see him, for it was his pleasure, for the best of reasons, to keep concealed. Why should you wish to behold me, he said? Have you any doubt of my love? Have you any wish ungratified? If you saw me, perhaps you would fear me, perhaps adore me. But all I ask of you is to love me. I would rather you would love me as an equal than adore me as a god. So, her monstrous husband, as they said, he was monstrous. is this great and mysterious provider who doesn't let himself be seen to her. And it gets really interesting here. It looks to me like they're alluding to the magical nature of the mind in that you dream something up in the psyche and then what they call or what we call magic is that thing you dreamed up becoming manifest. And so the psyche has this mysterious linkage back into the real world where we learn to fine-tune the psyche, um, use it right, and it leads to the manifestations that we desire and the, not the ones we don't. And it keeps concealed. It stays concealed. Like Psyche's mysterious husband here. Quote, For the best of reasons. Perhaps you would fear me, perhaps adore me, but all I ask of you is to love me. Continuing on with the book. This reason somewhat quieted Psyche for a long time. And while the novelty lasted, she felt quite happy. But at length, the thought of her parents left in ignorance of her fate, and of her sisters, precluded from sharing with her the delights of her situation, preyed on her mind and made her to feel her palace as but a splendid prison. When her husband came one night, she told him her distress, and at last drew from him an unwilling consent that her sisters should be brought to see her. 
So, calling Zephyr, she acquainted him with her husband's commands, and he, promptly obedient, soon brought them across the mountain, down to their sister's valley. They embraced her, and she returned their caresses. Come, said Psyche, enter with me, my house, and refresh yourselves with whatever your sister has to offer. Then, taking their hands, she led them into her golden palace, and committed them to the care of her numerous train of attendant voices to refresh them in her baths and at her table and to show them all her treasures. The view of these celestial delights caused envy to enter their bosoms. At seeing their young sister possessed of such state and splendor, so much exceeding their own, they asked her, Numberless questions, among others, what sort of a person her husband was. Psyche replied that he was a beautiful youth who generally spent the daytime in hunting upon the mountains. The sisters, not satisfied with this reply, soon made her confess that she had never seen him. Then they proceeded to fill her bosom with dark suspicions. Call to mind, they said, the Pythian oracle that declared you destined to marry a direful and tremendous monster. The inhabitants of this valley say that your husband is a terrible and monstrous serpent who nourishes you for a while with dainties that he may by and by devour you. Take our advice. Provide yourself with a lamp and a sharp knife. Put them in concealment that your husband may not discover them. And when he is sound asleep, slip out of bed, bring forth your lamp, and see for yourself whether what they say is true or not. If it is, hesitate not to cut off the monster's head and thereby recover your liberty. Psyche resisted these persuasions as well as she could, but they did not fail to have their effect on her mind, and when her sisters were gone, their words and her own curiosity were too strong for her to resist. So she prepared for her lamp and a sharp knife and hid them out of sight of her husband. When he had fallen into his first sleep, she silently rose and, uncovering her lamp, beheld not a hideous monster, but the most beautiful and charming of the gods, with his golden ringlets wandering over his snowy neck and crimson cheek, with two dewy wings on his shoulders, whiter than snow, and with shining feathers like the tender blossoms of spring. As she leaned the lamp over to have a nearer view of his face, a drop of burning oil fell on the shoulder of the god, startled with which he opened his eyes and fixed them full upon her. Then, without saying one word, he spread his white wings and flew out of the window. Psyche, in vain, endeavoring to follow him, fell from the window to the ground. Cupid, beholding her as she lay in the dust, stopped his flight for an instant and said, O oh, foolish Psyche! Is it thus you repay my love, after having disobeyed my mother's commands and made you my wife? Will you think me a monster and cut off my head? But go, return to your sisters, whose advice you seem to think preferable to mine. I inflict no other punishment on you than to leave you forever. Love cannot dwell with suspicion." So saying, he fled away, leaving poor Psyche prostrate on the ground, filling the place with mournful lamentations. So now we come to the issue of what does Cupid symbolize here? Cupid belongs to Venus as her son. Cupid does not belong to Psyche. Cupid is a product of of the primordial love force that binds the universe together. 
the best way to sum Cupid up is with the phrase to fall in love. Fall in love. Now, those are three words that you should pay careful attention to. Think of the word fall. Fall can be a good thing, but if it is a good thing, it's also going to be a bad thing. Now, on the other hand, fall is just a bad thing. If you fall and you learn a lesson from it about how not to fall in the future in the same manner, then no matter how injurious the fall was, you survived to learn a lesson from it. And it was bittersweet. It was counterbalanced. And you gained from the fall a timeless prize. A prize is wisdom. Cupid's arrow is the product of beauty and love combined with a poorly trained attention. For a while the attention is distracted for a prolonged period unnecessarily with the beauty and love that are affecting the person. Misfortune is going to creep up silently from the blind side as it always does, as we all know and strike. Cupid shoots arrows. Arrows are not um, a blessing to those who get shot with them. I don't care what kind of arrow it is or what it's dipped in, <laughs> so to speak. You're still getting shot with an arrow and it sucks. So, to me, it seems like a very hallmark thing to do. I mean the Hallmark Card Company, to say that it goes in this order, that Cupid shoots you with the arrow and you fall in love. I think that you fall in love and then Cupid shoots you with the arrow. Now you notice Cupid has two waters in his mother's garden to choose from. He has a sweet water and he has a bitter water. So, you have some mortal who is infatuated with the beauty and love that they're experiencing, here comes Cupid with either a bitter or a sweet arrow. And if it's bitter, the person is going to get a bad taste in their mouth, is going to depart from whatever infatuation had possessed him. And if it's sweet, then the infatuation will continue. That's just how I see it. If you've got another interpretation for it, I'd love to hear it. Now, the way her husband takes off flying out the window after she sees him, it to me is indicative of the nature of magic itself. It, um, you can witness the power of it, but there's something else that keeps you pursuing it, and and that might not be the case if the impression magic makes upon you doesn't wear off and wear off quick, leaving sort of a hollow that gives the impression that needs to be filled. And so you seek to fill it again and tend to, at least I do, make the works of magic bigger and bigger each time, starting from small, going to larger and larger, just to see what you can pull off. Now, what happens with her sisters is also really interesting. Psyche chooses to reveal to her sisters her new magical lifestyle, where what she dreams she'll have instantaneously, and it causes envy in them, great envy. And they get to taking her apart. And they work themselves in like a corkscrew. And make her question the nature of her husband. And so she does this thing that she winds up regretting so much that she jumps out of a window. To me this is 
magical success. It's success, period. Um, you're always going to have those people that when they see you successful are going to become jealous and envious instead of inspired. Instead of you becoming the fire under their ass to do greater, they become envious and in some perverted fashion they try to destroy you. And I've experienced this plenty of times in my life. and I'm sure a lot of you have too. It's a very real thing. So that's what they did here. And nowadays, you know, some people, if you tell them about your magical lifestyle and you try to describe to them how intense it is, how exciting it is, how it fills you with a sense of purpose and passion, and they're not likely to really hear what you're saying unless they've been through the same thing. And they might just discount it. They might try to listen and not really understand the weight of what you're saying, the gravity of what you're saying. They might ridicule you, silently or otherwise. In today's day and age, there are a lot of people who are likely to call you a schizophrenic or something. And if you're not familiar with the kind of mindset, the kind of sadistic mindset, sociopathic mindset that thinks it okay to apply labels to a person like that, you're probably going to run into one one day and just remember what I said about it. None of what such a person says means a goddamn thing. It's all an agenda that is completely and totally selfish in ways that you probably don't even understand. And it all is incredibly myopic. Their entire outlook you'll find, if you ever try to involve them in real in, honest intellectual discourse, you'll find that they have no real intellectualism about them. That they don't have the ability to be honest enough to really attain intellectually. And these are just the kind of mental midgets who have never experienced or will experience anything magical in their lives so don't pay attention to what they have to say a schizophrenic is a thoroughly dysfunctional person and the diagnosis of schizophrenia is used way too leniently today psychiatrists have way too much discretion and freedom in what they do to give these diagnoses and then to begin treating them with this drug or that drug and even if there are no drugs the fact that the psychiatrist will tell the poor person that their mind is broken may render that person in some degree or another hampered their full potential can't be accessed because they've been convinced that they're broken by a person that was supposed to be in a position of trust, a professional, who did not even have the professional integrity to actually study and understand the field that they're in. They're using their professional job title to identify personality characteristics in people that they don't like, that they personally have a bias against. They're not separating their ego from their work, and they are subsequently diagnosing people with disorders that they don't have, like Asperger's and Attention Deficit Disorder, Autism, and Schizophrenia, and Delusion, and so on and so forth. That, to me, is what's being portrayed here. You know, this girl wants to show her sisters, this psyche wants to show her sisters, what a wonderful life she now lives, and what her sisters do, take her apart and turn her against her husband to question him, causing him to fly away, 
Gone forever, I presume. She's been convinced to give up the magic in her life. And you can be too. Without an understanding of what is a sociopathic mindset. Understanding what a sociopath is, is critical to you being able to establish a psychic defense. Because even if you don't come into contact with a sociopath that you've known, the fact that they can pull you up in their mind allows them to launch the same verbal curses that they would be otherwise at you from a distance. Presumably any distance. It's the same thing with people praying for you. It's uh, abuse of telepathic communication. And as far as psychic defense goes, it should be one of your foremost concerns. Anyway, back to the book. When she had recovered some degree of composure, she looked around her. But the palace and gardens had vanished, and she found herself in the open field not far from the city where her sisters dwelt. She repaired thither and told them the whole story of her misfortunes, at which, pretending to grieve, those spiteful creatures inwardly rejoiced. For now, said they, he will perhaps choose one of us. With this idea, without saying a word of her intentions, each of them rose early the next morning and ascended the mountains, and, having reached the top, called upon Zephyr to receive her and bear her to his lord. Then, leaping up and not being sustained by Zephyr, fell down the precipice and was dashed to pieces. So to me, Zephyr is the condition of your being accepting of the fact that there is one primordial love. There's one master access point, and no magic can be done with any sort of reliability until you've recognized that. In fact, Alistair Crowley had that as a core component of his work. To him, love was a law, and love is a law. True love, not love generated within the psyche. So, Psyche's sisters set out to have the magical lifestyle that she had. And they launched, and when they launched, they weren't in keeping with the law of love called Zephyr. And they fell down and busted their shit. Now, if you come to know psychopaths, sociopaths, over a long period of time, you'll notice that this is the pattern for them. They'll get something good, deliberately destroy it. Get something good, deliberately destroy it. They leap, and they fall right back down just as fast as they leapt up. Nothing that they do is used to permanently elevate them in life in any fashion. They never get to that point of taking it up another rung in the energy ladder. It's something that they cannot do. In fact, you might say that it's an identifying quality if you're learning to identify them quickly. Their history will reflect it. They'll tell you a lot of stories of failure. And although a lifetime fraught with failure is not indicative necessarily of a psychopath or a sociopath, you will find that the psychopath or sociopath eventually has to fail one way or another even if, in the end, it's only spiritually failing, which is failing in all other respects, too. They cross into the afterlife as a soul that is damaged, fragmented, or lost. And every deity with integrity that demands a respectable character of anyone that they're working with 
will have forsaken them, and the only deities that will have anything to do with them are ones that don't have their best interests and don't know how to elevate them. And that is, you know, that's that's hell. That's pretty much what hell is, right? And so it doesn't matter if someone has, you know, multiple wives and multiple flashy cars and riches and all these different things. They've automatically failed in life if none of that has served to elevate them in the ladder of energy of the universe, or the ladder of love, you could say. The greater energy potential you come into, the more of a binding force you have to possess. Because the energy is an expansive force. It's always an expansive force. To counterbalance it, and to make it so that it doesn't destroy its wielder, you need an equal force of love. So as you climb the ladder, you gain more energy, you'll also gain more love, which basically means more stability. Anyway, continuing on with the book. Psyche, meanwhile, wandered day and night, without food or repose, in search of her husband, casting her eyes on a lofty mountain, having on its brow a magnificent temple, she sighed and said to herself, Perhaps my love, my lord, inhabits there, and directed her steps thither. She had no sooner entered than she saw heaps of corn, some in loose ears and some in sheaves, with mingled ears of barley. Scattered about lay sickles and rakes and all the instruments of harvest without order, as if thrown carelessly out of the weary reaper's hands in the sultry hours of the day. This unseemly confusion the pious psyche put an end to by separating and sorting everything to its proper place and kind, believing that she ought to neglect none of the gods, but endeavor by her piety to engage them all in her behalf. The holy series, whose temple it was, finding her so religiously employed, thus spoke to her, O Psyche, truly worthy of our pity, though I cannot shield you from the frowns of Venus, yet I can teach you how to best allay her displeasure. Go then and voluntarily surrender yourself to your lady and sovereign, and try by modesty and submission to win her forgiveness, and perhaps her favor will restore you to the husband you have lost." So, the mind loses its magic, the mind wanders to another kind of temple, the temple of Ceres, where it finds tools of harvest laying all over the place and goes to arranging them and making them orderly. And Ceres, the deity Ceres, who is a goddess of agriculture and fertility and motherly relationships and crops, tells her that she needs to go submit to Venus and try to repair her relationship with her. Continuing on with the book, Psyche obeyed the commands of Ceres and took her way to the temple of Venus, endeavoring to fortify her mind and ruminating on what she should say and how best propitiate the angry goddess, feeling that the issue was doubtful and perhaps fatal. Venus received her with angry countenance. Most undutiful and faithless of servants, said she. Do you at last remember that you really have a mistress? Or have you rather come to see your sick husband? yet laid up of the wound given him by his loving wife. You are so ill-favored and disagreeable that the only way you can merit your lover must be by dint of industry and diligence. I will make trial of your housewifery. Then she ordered Psyche to be led to the storehouse of her temple, where was laid up a great quantity of wheat, barley, millet, vetches, beans, and lentils prepared for food for her pigeons, and said, 
Take and separate all of these grains, putting all of the same kind in a parcel by themselves, and see that you get it done before evening. Then Venus departed and left her to her task. But Psyche, in a perfect consternation at the enormous work, sat stupid and silent, without moving a finger to the inextricable heap. While she sat despairing, Cupid stirred up the little ant, a native of the fields, to take compassion on her. The leader of the ant hill, followed by whole hosts of his six-legged subjects, approached the heap, and with the utmost diligence, taking grain by grain, they separated the pile, sorting each kind to its parcel, and when it was all done, they vanished out of sight in a moment. Venus, at the approach of twilight, returned from the banquet of the gods, breathing odors and crowned with roses. Seeing the task done, she exclaimed, This is no work of yours, wicked one, but his, whom to your own and his misfortune you have enticed. So saying, she threw her a piece of black bread for her supper and went away. Next morning, Venus ordered Psyche to be called, and said to her, Behold yonder grove which stretches along the margin of the water. There you will find sheep feeding without a shepherd, with golden shining fleeces on their backs. Go, fetch me a sample of that precious wool gathered from every one of their fleeces. Psyche obediently went to the riverside, prepared to do her best to execute the command, but the river god inspired the reeds with harmonious murmurs, which seemed to say, O maiden, severely tried, tempt not the dangerous flood, nor venture among the formidable rams on the other side, for as long as they are under the influence of the rising sun, they burn with a cruel rage to destroy mortals with their sharp horns or rude teeth. But when the noontide sun has driven the cattle to the shade, and the serene spirit of the flood has lulled them to rest, you may then cross in safety, and you will find the woolly gold sticking to the bushes and the trunks of the trees. So all of this is concerning a psyche's ability to be a useful tool to its wielder. The sorting of the beans and the seeds it has to do with discernment, separating things where they need to be separated. Using individuation where necessary, but recognizing collectivity as it exists. Recognizing how things are similar, recognizing how they're different, and all that. But what does Psyche do? She goes and gets the six-legged insects, or rather, Cupid provides her with the six-legged insects, which is a mistake. Now, what these six-legged insects represent to me are religions, are rigid ideologies. They don't have individual minds of their own. They're units of a hive mind controlled by a hive mind, and thus they are unfit to perform discernment for us. And the mistake that we make when we take any religion or magical system in the wrong way or too seriously or not seriously enough, when we allow it to take the place of our natural and true discernment, that's what we're doing, is where this task of discernment bestowed upon us by love to mindless servants who are unfit to do it. So Venus issues her another task. It says, go over here and take wool from each one of these quote-unquote sheep. The sheep turn out to be rams. Rams are male sheep, which have the ability to fight and be aggressive and defend themselves. 
and they often have big huge horns protruding down the front of their head that they use to ram things with. So the sheep is significant in its innocence and its benevolence. It's an herbivore. It doesn't make too much noise. It doesn't go around messing with other things. It It's a sheep, you know. But a male sheep is all of that combined with the ability to be aggressive and to fight and defend itself. So, innocence and benevolence that will kick your ass if you mess with it. Continuing on with the book. Thus, the compassionate river god gave Psyche instructions on how to accomplish her task. And by observing his, his directions, she soon returned to Venus with her arms full of the golden fleece. But she received not the approbation of her implacable mistress, who said, I know very well it is by none of your own doings that you have succeeded in this task, and I am not satisfied yet that you have any capacity to make yourself useful, but I have another task for you. Here, take this box and go your way to the infernal shades, and give this box to Proserpina and say, My mistress Venus desires you to send her a little of your beauty, for in tending her sick son she has lost some of her own. Be not too long on your errand, for I must paint myself with it to appear at the circle of the gods and goddesses this evening. So, the golden fleece is what? The golden fleece is the product of the rams. The rams, to me, are symbolizing the martial protection that comes with order. Wherever you find things well ordered, you will also find them pretty well protected. Gold symbolizes permanence. Fleece symbolizes protection, warmth, comfort. Fleece is what you make wool from. Wool is probably the best outdoor fabric that there is. And that it will insulate you even if it's wet. So golden fleece is the product of the martial protection of order. And the woolly gold sticking to the bushes and the trunks of the trees, as the book quotes, is that influence rubbing off on others around it. It's bestowing a free gift of its own essence upon those around it. And they've more or less earned it in having to deal with the callousness that is so typical of such a thing, of martial orders. And martiality is not something that you can simply understand and embody without having done it yourself. If not having to deal with these creatures in proximity and be subject to them, be subject to the martial order, then you have to be part of it. It's one or the other. But you can't come in as an outsider who is unfamiliar with the nature of it and take its benefits and keep them. That's not the way it works. The mind needs permanence. It needs martial order in order to be an effective tool. And it's not enough to look shallowly and from a distance at an example of martial order and then just have it to have its comfort and protection and warmth. You have to understand it and finally embody it, which puts you in that rank 
makes you worthy of protection. Now in the next part of the story, she's going to go make contact with Proserpina, who's also known as Persephone. And from here I'm not going to bother to break this stuff down, because we're already an hour in, and with the allegory that I've given so far, you should be able to, after looking up the deities that follow here, gain more of an understanding of the story. But what I've described thus far is of great importance to the magical student. Continuing on with the book, Psyche was now satisfied that her destruction was at hand. Being obliged to go with her own feet directly down to Erebus. Wherefore, to make no delay of what was not to be avoided, she goes to the top of a high tower to precipitate herself headlong, thus to descend the shortest way to the shades below. But a voice from the tower said to her, Why, poor unlucky girl, dost thou design to put an end to thy days in so dreadful a manner? And what cowardice makes thee sink under this last danger, who hast been so miraculously supported in all thy former? Then the voice told her how by a certain cave she might reach the realms of Pluto, and how to avoid all the dangers of the road, to pass by Cerberus, the three-headed dog, and prevail on Charon, the ferryman, to take her across the black river and bring her back again. But the voice added, When Proserpina has given you the box filled with her beauty, of all things this is chiefly to be observed by you, that you never once open or look into the box nor allow your curiosity to pry into the treasure of the beauty of the goddesses. Psyche, encouraged by this advice, obeyed it in all things, and, taking heed to her ways, traveled safely to the kingdom of Pluto. She was admitted to the palace of Proserpina, and, without accepting the delicate seat or delicious banquet that was offered her, but contented with coarse bread for her food, she delivered her message from Venus. Presently the box was returned to her, shut and filled with the precious commodity, Then she returned the way she came and was glad to come out once more into the light of day. But having got so far successfully through her dangerous task, a longing desire seized her to examine the contents of the box. What, said she, shall I, the carrier of this divine beauty, not take the least bit to put on my cheeks to appear to more advantage in the eyes of my beloved husband? So she carefully opened the box, but found nothing there of any beauty at all, but an infertile and truly Stygian sleep, which, being thus set free from its prison, took possession of her, and she fell down in the midst of the road, a sleepy corpse without sense or motion. But Cupid, being now recovered from his wound, and not able longer to bear the absence of his beloved Psyche, Slipping through the smallest crack of the window of his chamber, which happened to be left open, flew to the spot where Psyche lay, and, gathering up the sleep from her body, closed it again in the box, and waked Psyche with a light touch of one of his arrows. Again, said he, hast thou almost perished by the same curiosity, but now perform exactly the task imposed upon you by my mother and I will take care of the rest. Then Cupid, as swift as lightning, penetrating the heights of heaven, presented himself before Jupiter with his supplication. Jupiter lent a favoring ear, and pleaded the cause of the lover so earnestly with Venus that he won her consent. On this he sent Mercury to bring Psyche up to the heavenly assembly. Where she arrived, handing her a cup of ambrosia, he said, Drink this, Psyche, and be immortal. Nor shall Cupid ever break away from the knot in which he is tied, but these nuptials shall be perpetual. 
Thus Psyche became at last united to Cupid, and in due time they had a daughter born to them whose name was Pleasure. The fable of Cupid and Psyche is usually considered allegorical. The Greek name for a butterfly is Psyche, and the same word means the soul. There is no illustration of the immortality of the soul so striking and beautiful as the butterfly, bursting on brilliant wings from the tomb in which it has lain, after a dull, groveling caterpillar existence, to flutter in the blaze of day and to feed on the most fragrant and delicate productions of the spring. Psyche, then, is the human soul, which is purified by sufferings and misfortunes, and is thus prepared for the enjoyment of true and pure happiness. Yeah, that's that's a very Christian way of putting it. I don't agree with that. Psyche does not mean soul. Soul means soul. There had to be some mix-up there. Um... If you were to validate that in the modern day, well, you couldn't validate that in the modern day because psych, as it is in the word psychiatry and psychology and psychological, indicates toward the mind, not the soul. But I wouldn't think it too remote of a possibility that since the work that we're reading right now or the data that it was assembled from, had to be delivered to us by the Vatican, that things wouldn't get just a little bit mixed up. And that the way the stories are arranged in allegorical fashion is very ingenious and in that nobody even sees a reason to modify it or adulterate it. And if they do, they don't modify or adulterate the right parts to make it useless. Life is not about. Life is not built from suffering and misfortune. Suffering and misfortune are half of life. The other half, well, you know what that is. That's love and beauty and so on and so forth. But no spirit is matured, no soul is matured by only suffering and misfortune. That's a very Judeo Christian or Catholic, Judaistic way to look at things. Very sadistic way to look at things. So don't let them confuse you there. And, any, and with any book you read, if it's printed before a certain time, like the, the data that this is assembled from obviously comes from the ancient days, which means it had to come through us, come to us through the hands of the Vatican. And there's going to be stuff in there that doesn't belong. After a certain point, um, heresy laws are no longer effective or being enforced. And so literature arrives to us directly from the author's mouth, so to speak, without having to be modified or approved of by a religious authority. Yeah, what a terrible damn thing that is, huh? In works of art, Psyche is represented as a maiden with the wings of a butterfly, along with Cupid, in the different situations described in the allegory. Milton alludes to the story of Cupid and Psyche in the conclusion of his Comus. Quote, Celestial Cupid, her famed son, advanced, holds his dear Psyche, sweet entranced. After her wandering labors long, Till free consent the gods among. Make her his eternal bride, And from her fair unspotted side. Two blissful twins are to be born, Youth and joy, so Jove hath sworn. So, in Milton's poem, Cupid and Psyche have twins named Youth and and joy. The allegory of the story of Cupid and Psyche is well presented in the beautiful lines of T.K. Harvey. Quote, 
They wove bright fables in the days of old, when reason borrowed fancy's painted wings, when truth's clear river flowed over sands of gold, and told in song its high and mystic things. And such the sweet and solemn tale of her, the pilgrim heart to whom a dream was given, that led her through the world love's worshipper to seek on earth for him whose home was heaven. In the full city by the haunted fount, through the dim grottoes, tracery of spars, mid the pine temples on the moonlit mount, where silence sits to listen to the stars, in the deep glade where dwells the brooding dove, the painted valley and the scented air, she heard far echoes of the voice of love and found his footsteps traces everywhere. But never more they met since doubts and fears, those phantom shapes that haunt and blight the earth, had come twixt her a child of sin and tears and that bright spirit of immortal birth. Under her pining soul and weeping eyes had learned to seek him only in the skies till wings until the weary heart were given, and she became love's angel, bride in heaven. The story of Cupid and Psyche first appears in the works of Apuleius, the writer of the second century of our era. It is therefore of much more recent date than most of the legends of the Age of Fable. It is this that Keats alludes to in his, quote, Ode to Psyche. Quote, O latest born, and loveliest vision far, of all Olympus's faded hierarchy, fairer than Phoebe's sapphire region star, or Vesper, amorous, glow warm of the sky, fairer than these, though temple thou hast none, nor altar heap with flowers, nor virgin choir to make delicious moan upon the midnight hours, no voice, no lute, no pipe, no incense sweet, from chain swung censer teeming, no shrine, no grove, no oracle, no heat, of pale mouth prophet dreaming. In Moore's Summer Fitte, a fancy ball is described, in which one of the characters personated is Psyche. Quote, not in dark disguise tonight hath our young heroine veiled her light, for see she walks the earth, love's own, his wedded bride by holiest vow, pledged in Olympus, and hath made known to mortals by the type which now hangs glittering on her snowy brow that butterfly, mysterious trinket, which means the soul, though few would think it. And sparkling thus, on brow so white, tells us we've Psyche here tonight. You know, uh, I'm going to have to look more into this. Uh, their use of Psyche to mean soul. It just doesn't make sense. Um, I think this is more of the same old mental midgetry that comes with both the scientist and the religionist. They're all mental midgets in their own right. Very few break the mold to discover anything truly remarkable. The word psyche... In any modern way that we use it means mind. Soul, you can either say is your spirit, in which case it's like saying soul is in the sun god, S O L. That spark of divinity that is your divine power, your spirit. Or, you can look at the soul as the sort of ashtray of experience. It has all the 
distilled and purified experience of everything you've been through. But the psyche is the mind. And everyone in the modern day would agree on that. And I think they attempted to Judaize this myth and it didn't really work. And in their attempt to Judaize the myth, if you were to look at it that way, it would not make sense at all. It would not make sense at all. In my opinion, the way I told it here makes a great deal of sense. It allows you to put all of the puzzle pieces painted by this myth into their proper places without leaving one out. And if you switch mind with soul, it just doesn't work anymore. But you have that same thing going on with a lot of different uh, material and ideas. They're either limited, stunted by science or by religion, and both are equally as bad equally as damaging. And I think it would behoove the serious researcher into the occult to always remember that no person on earth has the ultimate truth. Always remember that. If you're searching for truth, remember that nobody yet has it. So there should never come a time when you're saying to yourself, I've found the ultimate truth. You might say that the occultist work is never really complete, and in that way it is a sort of divine well for mystery and intrigue, a well that never dries up. Alright, that'll be all for this one. Thanks for listening, and have a good evening.